Hello and welcome to the Raptors show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find the Raptors show wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe, please, or interview the program. I'm your host, Blue. I'm joined by co-host Blake Murphy. Uh, one last show for the season, uh, and shortly we will be going to Darko uh end-of-season press availability. Uh, when he does eventually take the podium, he is scheduled to take it at 11. Um, would love to have been there, but at the same time, you know, the show is on, and I'm very much looking to hear what Darko is going to say. Blake, how you doing, man? I'm good. Uh, so I do have an eye on this, so I'll try to keep the questions brief. But you did manage to make it down to uh, the press availabilities yesterday, the ones that didn't take place during our show. Uh, so you got there in time for, for Scotty and IQ and Grady. Mm. Uh, any takeaways? Any any big thoughts from those? Uh, well, first off, big thanks to Raptors PR for, for setting up lunch for everybody. That was quite nice. Um but putting that aside, you uh, want to go into the details of the spread? I think I don't know. There was like patties. There was uh, actually a lot of carbs, to be honest. There was also like these like thick pizza slices, that kind of like focaccia style. Uh, yeah, and then some watermelon. You know, some snacks. It was great. It was it was a great time. No one no one wants to hear that. Uh, what what did the players talk about? I mean, it was a generally pretty positive attitude. It was actually really funny. Emmanuel quickly almost got a parking ticket because he. <laughs> He parked in the parking lot just as like the you know the the attendants were coming through, and so uh, he averted the parking ticket. Thank thank goodness. But um, yeah, he took the podium. He was, he was in great mood. He's like, "Good morning, everyone." And we were like, it, "Emmanuel, it, it's it's one thirty. Yeah, <laughs> it's one thirty. And he's like, "Oh yeah, you can tell I just woke up." Um, in any case, yeah, it was. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it was a pretty cheery atmosphere, even though the season obviously didn't go that well. I thought Scotty spoke really well. Um, I think that's something that goes along with the maturation of Scotty is like. Um, you know, I think he's 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 gotten better and better at sort of being able to express what he wants to say and also sort of what he feels on behalf of the team. It's it, it is a fairly important thing. Um, and I thought he spoke well. He spoke really maturely about sort of his position. Really, really talked about um, you know wanting to take leadership over the team. You know, speaking to guys during timeouts and huddles. That was a consistent messaging across. He referenced the play where in the last game eighty two. Uh, he got on Grady about a bad closeout in the first quarter. And for the rest of the game, Grady was making really hard closeouts in the right way. And, you know, Scotty and the rest of the team really encouraging him to do so. Like, even small wins like that are really, really important. And we had that conversation yesterday about sort of who's going to take ownership. I think Scotty really has that intent. And then the other big takeaway is just unprompted. Everybody just praised Garrett Temple. Like, I don't know if they had, like, a group chat and they were all like, hey, it's Garrett Temple Day. But, like, everybody talks so much good things about the presence that Garrett Temple did. Because, of course, you can't really talk about the product. They won 25 games and lost 57. But at least in terms of the people uh, in the organization, of course, uh, start leading with Darko, um, who also drew drew really strong reviews. Um, you know, at least the people are happy with each other. Yeah, that's good. That's, uh, I mean, like we talked about yesterday, that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is what happens on the court and, and you know, guys being better, Darko being better, et cetera. But as you go through... A lean year as you get ready for the offseason as you're trying to find that right balance of, of optimism but long-term development next camp those are the important things that that help stabilize and help you kind of navigate those those lower points if they come back up again so uh, that's important the scotty leadership stuff is great um you know would have liked one of those guys to be like yeah i love garrett temple a great teammate a great hit every week on the raptor show with will lou um they couldn't get that specific but whatever <laughs> yeah you know, yeah. hopefully they were checking it out and someone's like, hey, uh, you know, I, I'll do I, I learned how to do media weekly from from Garrett Temple. I'll do more media. You, first of all, you got to be as good as Garrett Temple. All right. So you don't have to be as good as Garrett Temple to get invited on the show. No, you're right. You're right. Um, but at the same time, <laughs> it'd be very ideal if, if you could be as uh, well spoken as, as Garrett. I actually would have loved for Garrett to have a season ending press conference, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I mean, I guess... Oh. But in any case, we do have Darko Ryakovic taking the podium, so we're going to cut to that feed. Next time. Darko, um, quite a few of your players were here yesterday and speaking about, you know, they got a lot of optimism for things next year. And I'm just wondering why, if you share in that optimism and, you know, is it... And what's it based on, given there's so much, so little time that anyone who would, might project to be on the team next year? Um, yes, uh, I definitely share that optimism. Uh, that optimism comes from um, us having very good situation with very young core. 
Uh, we have players that uh, like each other. We have players that uh, are very talented young players that have a, a bright future and players that are really ambitious and they, they want to put a lot, lot of work in. That's the uh, first part for me to, to be very optimistic about uh, the future and what next season holds for us. Uh, the other thing is that uh, we have uh, the best uh, front office uh, in NBA. Uh, we have uh, amazing ownership. Uh, we have amazing fan base. Uh, we have uh, very good coaching staff uh, that's working and pouring into players every single day. Uh, we have Alex McKechnie, who is the best thing in the world in, uh, in what he does. Uh, so uh, we have the best uh, media people over here. Uh, we have the best media coverage in the NBA. So uh, why, why, not to be, why, oh, why not to be optimistic? Why not to be optimistic? <clears throat> This was obviously your first uh, full season as an NBA head coach. How did it live up to your expectations? Well, uh, if you would ask me this like uh, 12 months ago uh, or when I was interviewing for a job, I could probably not foresee everything that came our, our way. And if you would ask uh, Phil Jackson, he would tell you the same thing. I don't think he had a chance to see anything like this. Uh, so uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was a season uh, of... Um, a lot of uh, challenges, a um, lot of changes, a um, lot of uh, stuff that were happening on the court uh, with the trades and changes, and also off the court uh, things that we could not uh, we could not control. But at the same time, it was uh, amazing uh, opportunity to learn uh, to see how people react in those uh, those situations. Uh, to see how everybody is resilient through that that process and he, how everybody at the end uh, came uh, came together, um, and uh, the big reason why everybody sharing this optimism is that we stick together to uh, with each other and and we we have a clear path what we want to do in the future. You talked about uh, player development and how to program basically for every player on the roster. What's your own development this summer? Then? Uh, my first uh, the part, my first part of my development is to get some sleep. Uh, that's that's number one, and then um, I kind of like have uh, every season I have uh, my own way of of preparing. Um, I like to watch different teams, different leagues. Uh, I like always to catch up to see on some new tendencies in the basketball world. Uh, I like to read books. Uh, I like to uh, work on myself uh, as uh, as a leader. Uh, what I can do better. Uh, I have a list of uh, stuff that you know during the course of the, of the season I'm thinking about, and uh, because of the nature of business, I don't have enough time to address that during the regular season. Now in off season, uh, there is going to be more time for me to reflect and uh, to learn and to be better prepared to handle different situations ahead of me. What did you learn about yourself as a coach during the season? You know, uh, for pretty much my whole career, I was always coaching teams that had uh, positive records and winning and competing to win championships and and all of that. Actually, as, as a head coach, I had only one losing season, and that was my second year in, in the G League. Uh, and uh, I think what I learned about myself is just that ability to keep the big picture, you know, in the first plan. It's not easy to lose, and it's not easy to stay on, on, a, on the sideline. And you saw me, Doug, standing with our guys until the last second of the last game. Um, and that's how I operate. I, I really believe in our guys and I'm going to pour everything into them. Uh, so uh, what I really learned there is uh, is importance of keeping the big picture, big picture and main thing, the main thing. Yesterday, the players were talking a lot about how you're forming off the court relationships with them. And that was kind of the main thing is that they were saying, you know, as much as um, they appreciate what you do on the court. It was more of the off-court stuff that really stuck with them. Um, why is it so important for you to form those off-court relationships with the players? And how do you think it helps them when it comes to basketball? Um, that's a very good question. I, I, first of all, it's, it's so easy to look at NBA players and uh, to, you know, to judge that everything is perfect in their lives and everything is easy. 
because what everybody sees, they, they see those guys for two and a half hours on, on bright lights, you know, and uh, all of them, they're much more than just basketball players. They have families, they have interests, they have, uh, well, they have uh, confidence, they have lack of confidence, they have, they're dealing with so many stuff that you and I and everybody else is de dealing in our lives. And I think it's very important to acknowledge that and uh, for them to know that uh, I stand behind them, that this organization stands behind them. I think it, it gives them uh, extra motivation to give back, to be the best they can be on the court for us and, and for themselves. Scotty was saying yesterday that he was really trying to use the time away when he was not able to play to grow as a leader. And, and certainly from our vantage point, we could see him being very vocal on the bench. In what ways did you see him grow as a leader as the season went on, and especially during the time when he wasn't able to play? Uh, very good observation, and uh, it's it's kind of like, to be honest with you, it's kind of like night and day, uh, comparing start of the season when he was timid and not sure what he's about to say and how to, to approach his teammates. We were working a lot on that and then building his voice with the team, and uh, in a certain way, it came like a it came like a blessing for his leadership not to be on the court for those last 20 whatever games he did not play because he was able to see the game through different lenses. Uh, he was able to appreciate the game even more because he's not out there and competing. And like I always tell guys, never take for granted, uh, for granted stepping on NBA court. You know, it's, it's a, such a privilege. And uh, I think that uh, having uh, leaders like we had in Ted Young and uh, especially second part of the year with Garrett Temple, it really helped him to, to see different side of it and the importance of good leadership and setting uh, the tone with example, but also learning how to talk with, with your teammates. Not every teammate is, is the same. With some guys, they need hugs. Some other guys need, come on, let's go pick it up. Um, just And the only way to learn that is if you, if you try. You know, and he had a lot of those situations uh, being on the bench, like his voice was amazing and uh, uh, supporting teammates, but also keeping them accountable. You know, he would come to me and say, coach, what, what, what coverages we're in? He, he would double check with me before talking to players, making sure that everybody's on, on the same page. So I think uh, I think uh, all of this has created a lot of um, hunger with him that he's going to be motivated to come next year as a better leader, as a better player. You mentioned Garrett, and I wanted to ask you about him as well, because Scotty mentioned that opportunity to sit and watch games with him and, and kind of see what kind of a leader he is. Obviously, you can't measure Garrett's impact with this team, looking at the numbers and the minutes and the games and all of that. So for people that don't have that perspective that, that you guys have on the inside. How would you describe what Garrett's meant to this team this year? Um, if you would see his competitiveness in the play groups that we had since day one, uh, if you would see his commitment to his teammates, all the conversations that he had with those guys on the sideline, you know, not not just in a game, it's just like scouting, preparation, getting get, getting everybody on the same page, understanding what, what we need to do, how we need to do it. All of that went long way, but then uh, him stepping on the court and actually doing it and, you know, putting his body on the line and uh, taking a charge or getting a steal or diving on the floor, that's like, wow, like what he was preaching whole year, that's not empty story. Like he really stands behind that. And that's, that's what, uh, and that's not leadership of Garrett Temple. That's like, that's leadership is a shared leadership uh, from everybody in the organization. You know, you need to lead by example first, and then people will follow you. You know, then you will be able to use your voice. And uh, I thought that, uh, that Garrett did outstanding job uh, with our young court over here and that we have a great leader in him. Are there specific areas that you're hoping to work with Scotty on for next season? Uh, yes. Uh, do you want me to share with you? <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, <clears throat> I think uh, as you could see, he's just uh, tapping in uh, his ability to uh, post up. Uh, uh, I think uh, he's very capable to score from low block, but also he's uh, he's going to be uh, 
attracting a lot of attention defensively. They're going to send two players to him, and now his playmaking ability can really flourish. You know, uh, I think him playing on the ball is a uh, natural step uh, for him and for us. Uh, interchangeable point guard together with uh, with quickly or RJ. I think it's a next evolution for our our team. Uh, and then uh, defense. You know, every time when when I talk to Scotty about his development, trust me, he's the first one to to keep bringing defense. You know, uh, and he wants to be considered the defensive player of the year. And I'm going to support him in that regard very much so. And next year, when I put him on the best uh, offensive player on the other team, there is not going to be for him like complaining why I have to do that. You told me you want to be that guy. So so we're going to really stretch him and help him in every possible way to be the best two-way player he can be. Um, as you guys can see, the way he's uh, pushing the ball in transition, his unselfishness, uh, his passing ability, um, his ability to score in the paint, continued improvement in the, in the three-point shooting. All of those areas are areas for him that he can make uh, next uh, next step. What does Zach Grady have to do this summer to make another leap? Obviously, he made a big leap in the second half of the season after he went on the program and everything. What, what do you expect from him this summer? And sort of what's the plan for him? Um, besides the obvious one that he needs to work on on his body, you know, he's a uh, 20 year old. <clears throat> At the beginning of the season, I said that he looks like he's 16. Then he looked like 16 and a half. Now he looks like 17. Uh, there, there is, a, there is a natural thing that's gonna happen with just him getting older. I think it's gonna, his body is gonna fill in, and then there is a lot of work to be done for him to get. <clears throat> Uh, stronger to to withhold the contact bed, better uh, and to be more physical on defensive end as well. I think that's number one thing for him. I thought that his uh, corner progression, playing from corners, uh, getting shots, uh, um, the reads, cuts, uh, driving from from that area of the floor, uh, is something that that he did really good job this year. Uh, in off season, they're going to look to to expand his box, to put him in different situations uh, that he can play out of, and continue to grow in that aspect as well. You mentioned uh, watching other games of basketball, trying to pick up on tendencies and certain things that are maybe on the cutting edge. When you look around the NBA and see the teams that are the most successful right now, what are you seeing? Whether it's from a tactical perspective or about skill sets, what are you seeing that you feel like you guys need to emulate to get to that level? And um, when you look at uh, the best teams around the league, uh, you really see a lot of skill. Uh, you, you see that their best players are very hard to handle. You know, that, that you're always hitting into like, how do we guard this guy? Do we need to send two on him? Do we have to rotate? Uh, uh, what are those uh, attacking points on the court? And I think uh, that really translates into our summer plans to develop our players to become more and more of that. You know, that they are more of a shooting threat, they're more of a driving, finishing at the rim threat, that uh, they're very capable to handle uh, defensive situations uh, better in one-on-one situations that we don't have to put two on the ball. Uh, so I think it's overall development of players because at the end of the day, when you watch NBA playoffs and, you know, I know what I see every single year, like all of the, the, those teams in the first round of playoffs, they run, I don't know, 20, 30 plays that gets cut down to 15, cuts down to 10, then you watch NBA Finals and it looks like they're not running plays, they're running very simple actions. Why? Because their players is so good in those situations that it's so hard to guard. And uh, my goal is is uh, uh, to develop our guys, not just over the summer, but uh, full next season and in the future to become really, really hard to handle in in, the, in one-on-one situations. Gary's numbers kind of this year. Um, how would you assess his season as he heads into free agency this year? Uh, he, uh, Gary Trent? Yeah. Gary Trent, uh, uh, I don't know what numbers you're talking about, but Gary Trent is the best spot up three point shooter in, in the league. Uh, Gary Trent, as uh, the season went on, was really able to diversify his game as well, to score much more off of cuts. Uh, I thought that he improved his uh, finishing around the rim, especially off two feet. Uh, 
when you look at just like numbers production, I, I agree obviously that his numbers deep down, but I think that that his overall game improved as this season uh, went on. Uh, Gary is is a player that's uh, extremely hard worker. Uh, he shows up every single night, every single practice. Um, he was a very important voice for us as well. That was another interesting one to see him from being very quiet at the beginning of season to actually, you know, speak up when we go through our scouting reports that uh, uh, his uh, leadership and voice went a long way. Bless you. Uh, working out with uh, together with uh, uh, Grady. So I think that he made a lot of strides that not necessarily are showing up on, on, on a box score. And uh, you could see Gary as well this year that, that, that he was passing the ball more than he did in the past. So I think there were very, some very, very positive stuff uh, in, his, in his game this year. As a team, there were some really positive numbers, um, expected efficiency in half court, you know, percentage of possessions with a paint touch. Um, how do you think your offensive systems, your playbook held up over the season? Um, what do you want to keep for next year and what might you want to change? Uh, we kept, uh, we were obviously with different personnel, different players. We were trying to simplify. We were trying to find what bet best fits those guys. And it just felt that, that uh, there was no moment that we had some continuity over stretch of games that we can stick with something it was like especially second part of the year there was so much change uh, i think uh, one theme that was constantly there is our paint touches ability to score in transition um, i think it was our ability to create for each other to create uh, open uh, open shots and our our unselfishness just ability to move the ball and then to have a potential assist uh, uh, high during the whole uh, season i think that's something that we can really build on. As, as you could see, we were really trying to develop our uh, off-ball game as well, uh, playing with, with cuts, playing in space, uh, uh, recognizing what are those situations. And, you know, it's different when you have different guys who are running offense through when you it looks differently when you when you have Kelly in those spots. Uh, it looks differently when you have some other personnel in those, those, those positions. So I think that we have a, a very intriguing uh, personnel to have a very good starting point for us. And obviously, um, I'm going to use the summer to watch a lot of film and to see what fits best. And uh, we'll see how roster is going to shake up uh, by, by the start of the training camp. And uh, based on that, we're going to be always making uh, necessary adjustments. But w the way I want our team to play is to play for each other, to move the ball, uh, to be aggressive, uh, attacking the paint, and uh, to go from there. And on that note of personnel that maybe fits better what you guys are trying to do when it wasn't for long but when you had quickly rj scotty and purtle on the floor those four you guys actually blew the doors off opponents uh, their net rating was huge does that feel like a number that matters or is that something that you know wasn't long enough and you sort of want to see how it works before you decide on what to build around um my eye test tells me that there is a lot of potential there uh, and a lot of opportunity for the growth. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to look at a small sample and say that's that's it for and, and t to take it for granted. You know, I think there is definitely things that we can do better offensively and defensively with, with that group there. And I'm excited to see those guys come back uh, in a training camp. And I'm sure they're going to look uh, Physically and skill-wise, they're going to look different. And it's going to be about, uh, you know, putting our egos aside and really trusting each other and put uh, winning on its, its first place. Because winning is why we're here, and that's what we want to develop. Sorry, you're going to have some flexibility. Um, you're going to have some flexibility, or not you, but the front office will have some flexibility in terms of draft picks, potentially three. Uh, there's some range of options in terms of what you might do in free agency, etc. What, as a coach, I'm presuming you're going to get consulted, what does this team need? Um, uh, every team needs the same thing. It needs great players. And uh, that's uh, where I'm really excited, that flexibility that you were uh, talking about and uh, potential draft picks and all of that. 
I mean, Bobby and Masai are, are the best in business and they, they do a really good job of evaluating the talent and putting the team together. So I have absolute trust in, in, in them that they're going to build the best roster possible for us. You must get consulted, right? So yeah. We can go. I need depth in these positions. Obviously, you traded away three six foot nine guys. Your team, right? A lot of nights was very small. Um, you know, it's it's the same thing that that, that you're seeing. Uh, it's it's size, it's skill, it's uh, ability to cover multiple positions. Um, it's uh, potentially backup point guard. You know, uh, we're still about to have all of those conversations to really assess what we have and before we head into into decision making. But just like I said, I have utmost uh, trust in, in uh, Masai and Bobby and we're going to have a lot of conversations this summer. Um, so I'm sure we're going to come up with, with great solutions for us. Do you have a sense of how far away this group at full strength? Obviously, there's some stuff that could happen with Gary and even Bruce and others. Um, how close it is from being competitive at full strength? Um, I think uh, that uh, those answers we're gonna get once we get in the season and see how how guys developed over the summer, and I have high expectations for our guys to put a lot of work in and to get better. Um, but we're entering uh, we entered the rebuild process uh, over over the course of the season, and that this process is never easy and never turns the corner too quickly you know so we understand that this is a process uh, and we understand that uh, that we have a lot of work to do over here uh, we're going to have a lot of patience with our guys but at the same time we are entering every single game uh, and every you know next season with with high expectations to to be very competitive and to win as many games as possible Jarko, I think it was IQ yesterday that mentioned that you've already started to speak to your players about getting together over the summer, having sort of like loose, uh, sort of organized practices together. What's the timeline that you've set out for them to be in touch? Like, how much rest are they going to get? And, like, how soon will they get back to work in whatever form that might take? Yeah, so uh, guys will take uh, three weeks off over here, and after that, everybody is gonna start working. I always tell tell guys, so it's, you you can come up with this. I don't know if this one is an urban myth. Uh, I heard about this one, but I I never found that article. Somebody, or maybe we can ask Dirk Dirk Nowitzki directly. I heard that somebody asked Dirk Nowitzki, "What is the biggest mistake you made as a player?" And he said, "Like one year, I took three weeks off. I didn't do anything. It was so hard to get back in rhythm of working out and in shape, etc." Um, and uh, the follow-up question is like, "What your summer looks like?" And uh, I always tell tell players like, uh, you know, you take three, four days off. Maybe you're not doing anything, but after that. Play tennis, you know. Go for for a swimming, you know. Go for a run, uh, you know. Do weights. You don't necessarily have to do basketball, but you don't want to shut down those high, uh, you know, high level machines. You don't want to shut them down and keep them in garage, you know. So uh, they need to stay stay active. So when the when it's time to to go back to basketball, you can. You're not starting from zero. You already at certain level of conditioning and um, and physical shape. Uh, so those three weeks off uh, they're gonna take, and guys are gonna slow slowly to get in, into the work. Uh, um, I already gave heads up to our coaching staff. They're gonna be we're gonna be traveling quite a bit. We're gonna go and see Scott in Miami, and we're gonna go and see uh, Kelly when he spends time uh, in Utah or when he spends spends time in Vancouver. We're already working on a scheduling where the guys are gonna be over the course of summer, and uh, we're gonna be traveling quite a bit to work with them, to meet with their uh, trainers, coaches, uh, to get everybody on the same page so we can work toward the, the, the common goals. Is that schedule any different for the players who will be playing at the Olympics, like Kelly and RJ? Uh, obviously, uh, Kelly and RJ and uh, guys that are going to be play, play for the for, uh, Canada national team, they're going to have their uh, uh, training camp. I believe it starts on uh, July 27, uh, June 27th, something like that. They're going to have a full month of preparation before heading to to France uh, those guys obviously they're gonna be peaking in the middle of the summer for a competition and we already had uh, detailed conversations what the summer look, needs to look like for them 
what is the skill look like early in the summer, how we can the best help them and prepare them for the Olympics as well. And then uh, after Olympics, they'll, they'll need to take some time off and, and rest a little bit before they are picking up again. I do think having Olympics and those kind of uh, competitions in the middle of the summer, it's actually more beneficial to NBA players than having it late in August or September because it gives them a little bit of break after the, the, that competition and allows them in September too to build, uh, build up again for, for NBA uh, season. RJ's efficiency numbers really took a jump when he joined the Raptors. But he wasn't really getting more wide open shots, at least according to the NBA's data and catch and shoot and corner threes, sort of similar numbers. What do you attribute those the rise in those numbers as a three point shooter and I guess overall? Um I think uh, RJ uh is a player he can touch the paint whenever he wants. Like he's he's so skilled. Uh, he's physical player. Uh, he can get all the way to the rim. And my message with him is, oh, don't settle for bad shots, but then you can create great shots. You can create the great shots for yourself and you can create great shots for uh, for your teammates. And that's where his playmaking ability comes in place. Uh, with that size and ability to touch the paint, now he can really see the court and then and, and find, uh, find open teammates. And... Uh, uh, I want him to take it to another level that he takes a lot of pride in, in that playmaking ability uh, because that's good for him and that's good for us as a team. Uh, I think his three-point shooting, he did a lot of work uh, with, with our coaches, uh, with Coach Jama specifically on uh, catch-and-shoot shots and spot-up shots. And he's really good at when he's not shooting off the dribble or on the lot of move and he's just catch-and-shoot threes and he, with his feet set. And that's something that we got to continue developing and working on. Uh, and I think that the mental part of, of him knowing that he's going to be uh, uh, used on offensive side, uh, that he's going to have uh, uh, touches, that he's going to play off of, off of his teammates and that he can create, I think, gives that, that confidence and rhythm to a player uh, to shoot the ball uh, with, with more rhythm when the ball comes to the, their hands. You've mentioned You've uh, mentioned the development of the communication in the team and especially with the younger guys. How, as a coach, do you approach building those skills, especially with these really young players who you mentioned like maybe are a bit more in tune to technology and stuff like that? Um, I think a uh, very important thing is to get those guys comfortable with each other, you know, and... Uh, while talking to two guys yesterday during exit interviews, common theme kept kept showing up. We're all same age, more or less. We like each other. We have same interest. Uh, we play video games. We like this or that. When you have common interests, it's much easier to connect, you know. And uh, I'm trying to create uh, uh, opportunities for them that they are uh, Aside from, you know, showing up in a locker room and being together on the court and trying to create opportunities for them that they will have a chance to connect. Is that a team dinner? Is that going for a bike ride? Is that, uh, you know, whatever we, we, we might come up uh, for next year. I think those environments allow them to be more of themselves to express themselves more as uh, not just like teammates and basketball players, but to get to know each other on a personal level. And that's how trust on the court is built as well, you know. Uh, so I'm going to continue doing that. I'm going to continue encouraging them to speak up and, and uh, to be good leaders. And that leader is not necessarily like best player on the team. It's you can lead whatever role you have on a team. Uh, so um, I, I'm, I'm really trying to help guys to feel comfortable in their own skin. There's been a, a lot of talk about your offensive system, and I think even with all the changing personnel over the course of the year, I feel like we all got a very good sense of what your offensive philosophy is. You guys had a pretty tough year on the defensive end. Did you feel like you got a chance to express a defensive philosophy, and how do you feel like what, like, what are the next steps, I guess, that you guys need to take in order to improve on that side of the ball? Uh, very good question. I, I think on defensive end, uh, it's, it really comes down to a lot of times it's size, a lot of times it's uh, 
comfort level, uh, knowing what you do, what, what you need to do on defense, and then that defensive side really depends on communication. On offense, you can play off of each other. You don't have to communicate. You know, you're playing pick and roll, or you touch the paint. If somebody's open, it's pretty clear what you need to do when, when to make a pass. But the defense, it, it really uh, demands high level of communication, uh, high level of trust. You know, I'm not going to jump in a coverage thinking that that's the right thing, but actually I got to listen and, and trust that my teammate is, is calling the right coverage. Uh, then knowing the game plan, knowing personnel, and we had a lot of guys, uh, especially second part of the year, they're playing NBA games for the for the first time. You know, so uh, them understanding that, you know, that's a hot shooter. You cannot short close out to him and dare him to shoot the ball. You know, or that player, he's amazing offensive rebounder and not, not taking it for granted. Ah, maybe he's not going to rebound in this situation. I think knowing league on defensive end is something that, that really helps. And I think continuity with the team and then schemes really helps with that. You know, so... Um, when you look at the time and we had Yak on the court, our defense looked better, but we never had a chance to see Yak on the court together with Ochai. And I believe that Ochai is a very good defensive player there as well. You know, and uh, players coming in the midseason and like uh, you're just trying. I, I, I felt that it was easier for me to establish that identity on offensive end. Then, then we were able to do it on defensive events. So uh, part of uh, development of our guys this summer is going to be not necessarily just ball handling and shooting the ball. It's going to be defensive side as as well. So I'm really excited uh, about uh, this new season and what it brings. My teams always, when I coached as, as a head coach, they were really good defensive teams and solid defensive teams. So I'm I'm excited to 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 go in the new season and and uh, see what we have. When you think back on this season, what are you most proud of? Oh, <laughs> tough one. Good question, but tough one. What I'm most proud of? I, 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 I would say uh, togetherness of not necessarily just players, roster coaches, but a whole organization. You know, we were, we were dealt some really tough cards this year. And uh, it was easy to point fingers and say it's his fault, my fault, her fault. And I, I think that we as organization, every single department of this organization stayed together and we understood what we're going through. And we understand that the only way how we're going to build is, is doing that, being together and being on the same page. So that, that's something that I'm really proud of everybody in our organization. Darko, uh, last one. Um, for a new head coach coming into their first off season, what are the challenges uh, in terms of getting up to speed, or maybe from your own experience? In terms of so, so like when a new head coach is hired, in your case, when you were hired, mm -hmm. you know, what is that first summer like? How hectic is it? How hectic was it? You're talking about last summer. Sure. Ooh. <laughs> it was very hectic. It was very hectic. Uh, so I was on my cell phone eight, nine hours a day, not texting, but actually talking. Mm -hmm. If you go back and look at uh, some of my early interviews, even summer league, I lost my voice. You know, I was trying to get the best coaching staff, best people, best experts on, on a team. That was number one. After that, uh, you know, go meet players, go talk to them, see their uh, expectations, their what, what they want, what they need. Uh, you know, um, then there was a tough decision after summer league: should I go home or not? And I decided, yes, I should go home, spend some time with my wife and my son. But that turned out to be me showing up in a coffee shop at eight in the morning and leaving that same coffee shop at five p.m. and being on my computer preparing for coaches' retreat and offensive, defensive blue books and how we're going to be doing scouting and all of that. You know, kind of like you're putting the whole system in. You know, so it was it was a lot, a lot of preparation, a lot of uh, you know, not enough time in a day. Um, so uh, I think we were able to establish a lot of those things in a, in a year one as a culture, and now there's going to be fine tweaks. Now it's a, it's a moment where I can really, you know, 
uh, help, uh, you know, the trust my assistant coaches even more, uh, how they can, you know, have their imprint in our team. But we have very sol solid core of our culture going into year two. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right, that was Darko Ryakovich's end of season press availability. A lot of things he touched on there. We can't get to all of it. Uh, there was obviously the the heavy tone of positivity, which um, has sort of been the the calling card and the, the signature trait of Darko when he begins when he's saying, We've "Got the best organization, the best fans, the best front office." He even said the best media. I know that's cap, but uh, still um, very relentlessly positive. I liked what he said about Scotty probably the most. That was my biggest takeaway. He talked about Scotty's growth. Not just on the court, but off the court. He he, he mentioned that Scotty was a little timid to start the season. They had to really work on getting him to speak up, talk to the rest of the group. And as the year went on, especially after the injury, which cost him the last six weeks of the, the season, um, he was able to really speak up, speak his mind. And you saw that tone, like I mentioned at the start of this show, but uh, yesterday in his press availability. And going forward, that's going to be something that's really, really um, needed. And so... That was my biggest takeaway. Blake, what was your biggest takeaway from yeah, that? Yeah, I, I liked that. I also liked, uh, you know, him relaying on. And this isn't a surprise given what the tone was at the start of the season, but that Scotty is asking for putting his hand up and asking for, hey, I want the toughest assignment next year. I want to be deep boy. Um, you know, oh, deep boy. <laughs> uh, I want to be, I want to be MIP. I want to be six Moy. No, no, Goodness. he wants, but he thinks he has being defensive player of the year in him. And we talked a little bit the other day about, you know, what is, what is next defensively and and i think a big component of that is deciding in which way you're going to use scotty barnes and and if scotty is up to the task of being the guy who guards the best player on the other team every night rather than you know being that kind of chaos free safety in the the pseudo corner four role um that's important and it's a good tone setter now you got to live up to that with the actual play as well but i, I thought that was good i i think you know from talking from hearing darko talk from hearing scotty yesterday from talking to garrett about it a little bit um, you know, it really does seem like it's been a good growing up year for Scotty. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for, for sure. And that, that's the most important thing, right? Because uh, we had the whole conversation yesterday, but he's going to be the one to lead this group. Yeah. And there's going to be maturation on the court and off the court. And I think on that front, we sh we saw both things hit this year. And so you just want to continue to see more of that. But I, I love the fact that he's being vocal and, and taking ownership of the group. But we saw multiple examples of that. Um, even when the camera panned over to the bench and he's just like on the sideline instructing guys, um, and getting really involved. But you also heard, you know, Grady, for example, talk to him about uh, all these little specific things. And, you know, uh, we're going to have to see how his chemistry grows with Emmanuel quickly. That's going to be a very vital two-man pairing. I think there's a lot more on the bone there that they haven't really got to. Scotty mentioned that yesterday as well, did he not? That he's excited to play a little bit more pick and roll with, with IQ? There was, yeah, there was, yeah, that was actually one of the questions I asked him about how his game fits with IQ and it, it, it fits with RJ. He spoke really highly of both of them as well. Um you know, especially with IQ, I think there is just more for the two-man game to be played there. I asked quickly that same question and quickly talked about how, you know, what should be special about that pairing is quickly can be the pick, the, the, the ball handler and Scotty screening for him and that creating opportunities. And also Scotty can have the ball and quickly be the one screening for him and they can sort of flip that pick and roll around. And that's what makes that combination special. I just think they didn't have enough time on the court to fully execute that. So... Hopefully that specific partnership grows. He also spoke really highly of RJ as well. I think Scotty's words for RJ was like, he can't be guarded one-on-one. -on -one. He always requires a double a team or a second defender rotating over because he's always going to the basket. And Scotty really mentioned and really appreciated how many opportunities that created for other guys, including himself, to, to score as well. Um, I also like what uh, what Darko said about Gary Trent. Um, <laughs> he, he called him the best spot-up shooter in, in the game, which statistically is not necessarily true, but like clearly a very strong spot-up shooter, um, and then he, I, I like that he acknowledged that he diversified his game in terms of scoring off of cuts, in terms of improving finishing off to the two feet. His overall averages are not as strong as last year. In fact, they're a little bit worse. But you did see those like in between, like the the smaller things within the game. And I don't know if that makes you feel more optimistic that the Raptors will be bringing Gary back or not. But I did like that Darko said something about Gary because I felt like you know Gary just doesn't get talked about that much, at least. In the official capacity? So, okay, the, there are three components to this. The first one is he was 17th in spot-up sh three-point shooting, which is still really, really good. That's high volume. Yeah, I used sure. a pretty high volume cutoff there, 43.1%. And the consistency year over year is incredible. That's mm -hmm. going to be the number one thing on his 
resume when he goes looking for a deal this year. Uh, number two is that I'm not going to take anything anyone says to mean anything about free agency. That's a general feeling that I have anyway. But also last year at Darko's intro presser, they trotted out a bunch of developmental guys, including and, and talked a bunch about Delano Banton. And then oh, none yeah. of those guys were back. So I'm not putting a lot of weight into uh, what's said specifically about players okay, today or enough. even tomorrow with Masai. More to your point, though, yes, I think that Gary deserves uh, a lot of credit for and And we, I did this last week, uh, and then he had a really bad game after, uh, dragged me into being like, you know what, Gary's had a really good second half mm -hmm. of the year, um, but he's done a lot. He, he's stepped up from a like, maturity and on-court leadership role when so many guys ex other than him were down. Um, the play trended upward in the right direction. The three-point shooting's always there, but adding those versatility components would still love to see him be able to make a little bit more of uh, reads for other people off of those situations where he's getting the ball in, in advantageous spots, but the scoring is so valuable on a team that needs it as bad as the Raptors have this year mm -hmm. uh, that it really stood out in this second half of the year. He, he was probably the most stabilizing force in that last third of the season when the wins weren't coming, but still you gotta, you gotta have someone on offense. Someone's going to score a hundred points. Yeah. Someone's got to organize you. Someone's got to be the guy that gets the ball five seconds left on the shot clock. Um, yeah, I think he, he gets a lot of credit for how he's handled this season individually and from a kind of on-court leadership perspective. If not, I, I mean, he doesn't get brought up a ton as part of the like vocal leadership core, which I don't think, you know, fits personality wise, maybe, but certainly from a lead by example standpoint. So there was one question that I really wanted to ask Darko, and I'm really happy that a friend of the program, Joe Wolfon, last ever guest of the Raptors show, Joe Wolfon, uh, asked um, Darko about sort of what his defensive identity was and did they get a chance to sort of express it. Darko gave a very long answer, um, talked about the importance of communication, for example, but did you, maybe I just didn't hear it in, in the proper way, but did you get a satisfactory answer from Darko in terms of, okay, what do the Raptors under Darko Rajakovic want to do on defense? No, uh, he did what I tend to do, which is say a lot without saying much, <laughs> actually. Waffled? Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I might just have to go back and listen to it again, because again, it just happened live. I was really <laughs> perked up, but I, I, I didn't get like a, Okay, he, X, Y, and Z. No, yeah. I, he definitely didn't get into, you know, tactical stuff. He he talked okay. more about, like, philosophically and then, hey, the track record of my teams has been everywhere I go. They're good defensive teams, um, which is, is true. So maybe that's a little bit of, hey, we don't put the cart before the horse. Like, we need the personnel and we need to develop and we need to build the habits first. Okay. Um, and he's just not in an evaluation stage yet. He also made a comment. He got asked uh, by Louis Satzman about the small window where the guys – who are going to be here long term actually did get to play together and he was like i basically like i'm not putting much into that like sample wise mm. uh either so i think those things are probably okay. kind of related that he's just maybe not at that stage yet in plotting out what the defense is going to look like um but i'm with you I, I didn't think yeah we it just i'm not surprised I'm, it's not a criticism of darko that he yeah, didn't yeah. really answer the question I'm but just curious no, about I, I got nothing out of it yeah because you know I, I did ask quickly and grady about this yesterday and quickly about defense i mean it, it's Fairly general, but he did mention that it's about mindset first and foremost, the, the will to actually want to play defense, the focus on it, and then, of course, the experience of like being able to play with each other and knowing each other's tendencies. Well, the reason I asked quickly is because he was coming from playing under tips, who I'm sure spent a lot of time drilling defense into everybody. So I'm not uh, surprised that he talked about the mentality aspect. Um, you know, he also mentioned that he's a two-way player and that, you know, you know, other guys on the team are two-way players. I would love to see more of that two-way, especially on the defensive end from quickly on that front. But again, the season was so messy that it's, it's hard to evaluate. And then I asked Grady, and he actually had a really good answer about what he can do to improve on defense. I asked him, I was like, towards the end of the season, we saw you play a lot, and there were certain games like Jimmy Butler was seeking out for one-on-ones, for Dennis Schroeder was seeking out for one-on-ones. This was a pattern for the season. And he talked about sort of his goal is to continue working on core strength uh, with Johnny Lee, the uh, you know the trainer. And I think for him to get stronger is going to be a big part of Grady's plan. So I do, I do think certain players certainly have the specific aspect down, but I think maybe just in terms of that specific answer, I didn't get uh, the full thing. But, I, you know, the other theme to come out of this whole thing, and it's time now for the spicy stat of the day. Well, it's just not a status. This is a spicy take of the day brought to you by new Chunky Spicy Soup. Are ready to get fired up? The, the, the spicy take in the last one here is just, let's just make sure to bring back Garrett Temple. Everybody spoke so highly about Garrett Temple. He already told us on this show and obviously others as well. Um, but most importantly, he said that he wants to be here again next year if the Raptors will have him. And again, the one takeaway is just everybody had a lot of appreciation for Garrett. It's not like there was a reporter there asking and prompting everyone to talk about Garrett. 
the players would just bring it up themselves. And yeah, I mean, I think, look, of course, you're going to bring some new rookies into this situation. Team most likely gets even younger as compared to this year. But at the same time, it's very important to have that veteran voice, especially somebody who can, in a pinch, step on the floor and show them how it's done as well. So salute to Garrett Temple. Everyone, Garrett, you already know we love you on the show. We come on the show all the time. Um, and yeah, we got confirmation from the likes of Scotty and quickly yesterday too, who also spoke quickly of, uh, well, well of, of Garrett Temple. So let's run that clip too. Everybody keeps making fun of me because I don't take charges. Uh, so he looked at me and uh, just kind of started laughing. And I went over to give him a shake. He's 37 taking charges. So if he can do it, uh, anybody, everybody should be taking charges. Um, but now nah, he's been great for our team. The mindset he has, the day, the day to day grind that he brings, and uh, his energy every day, and his knowledge of the game is high. So appreciate him. Just being able to grow um, as a leader. Uh, just being every day sitting next to Garrett Temple, picking out his mind, um, watching the way he handles things, and he gets out there on the floor and plays so hard and so passionate. Uh, for me, just sitting back and watching that, um, you know, I just can't wait to get back on that, the floor and play my heart out. Uh, just seeing the type of vet he is and how he just – doesn't take things for granted. Uh, you know, that helps me. There you go. Okay, so that's most of what's going to happen in the offseason. I think if we're going to do a super quick rundown of what to do, resign quickly, first and foremost. What do you think is going to come in at? Somewhere between 20 and 25 at an annual value. I, I don't know if they try to front load that because this is the, the small cap hold year and you want to make sure you're, you're well protected when Scotty Supermax kicks in and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, 22, if I had to guess. I'd be pretty happy with 22. I think it's probably going to be 25, between 25 and 30. Okay. Yeah. Um, is Gary back? Is Bruce back? Um, it's tough. I'll say Gary, yes. Bruce, no. Okay. You? And um, probably the same way, actually. And then the three picks, are we going to use all three? If we if we obviously get the the one that is obviously half owed to San Antonio at this point, uh, no, I'll say they end up using two, and then obviously there'll be some undrafted free agent or whatever in, okay. in camp as so well. So there will be three new faces there in terms be, of the rookie class. Yeah, yeah, I mean, even if it's on a two way or whatever, they always do that. Fair enough. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it's going to be an exciting off season. I know this year, obviously, on the Raptor show, uh, you know, uh, it, it's we pivoted to two hours. We um, you know, try to expand the programming. I think really more than anything else is just the Raptors had a difficult year. So I appreciate everyone for sticking through, uh, not w only with us on the show, but also with uh, the Raptors season as a whole. And, you know, I, I know, whatever, the, the ending was was pretty bad. But at the same time, I'm very much going to miss it as soon as, you know, this whole thing wraps up. Tomorrow we'll hear from Masai. Uh, I am curious to see what he says as well about this whole thing. But uh, yeah, lastly, obviously, you know, I've, I've already said my piece about this last week, but... Um, obviously, this is my last show uh, on the Raptor show. It's meant a lot to do this. It's really meant a lot to see all the reaction and all the appreciation. It sort of really affirms that um, what we did here was really, really special. And um, I, I just really appreciate that first and foremost. I realized also listening back to what I said last week, last Friday, when I announced I was leaving, didn't get to say enough about the producers of the show. And um, I think it, it starts with Derek Brandeo. I mean, that was Bob McCowan's producer. Uh, that I mean, when I heard that, I, my ears perked up, but I didn't know who he was as a person. He was, he, he brought such a liveliness to the program all the time. Great energy, was on top of everything. And of course, the drops, the legendary drops. JR, of course, you know who you are, JR. Everyone knows JR, but he is genuinely one of the most hardworking, one of the most warm hearted people. Jennifer Rolnick, uh, welcome back from vacation. A lot has changed, but <laughs> also, you know, you have brought such a you know great energy and uh, support to this whole group. So I wanted to make sure I shouted out my producers as well. Uh, and of course, Ahmed, uh, Alex, Mark Boffo, everybody who contributed, Daniele this year in particular, my goodness, some of the biggest gets, Adam Silver. Uh, I appreciate all of you guys so much. So um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, you know, we're going to sign off for the show. And uh, yeah, for the last time, I've been your host, Willow. You've been listening to The Raptor Show on the Sportsnet Radio Network, brought to you by Campbell's new Chunky Spicy Soup. It's time to get fired up. Make sure you find The Raptor Show wherever you listen to podcasts. Subscribe. Please rate and review the program. Thanks once again to producer Ahmed Mon, our board producer, Lance Kennedy, Jennifer Olnick, David Sis, Jared Manitat for helping with the show. And uh, yeah, we will, well, 
someone will be back to talk to you next season. Yeah, Jays Talk Plus starts Thursday, by the way, in this same time slot. So I, I'm still here. Okay. We're just moving over to the Blue Jays. Let's go, Starting baby. Thursday, uh, 11 to 12, moving forward. So see you then. I can't wait. I'm going to the Jays game tonight, actually.